welcome everybody to the uh, Tuesday night presentations. Um, before we get going here, I'd like to uh, just to remind everybody to um, keep checking up with the YouTube Model Builders website at youtubemodelbuilders.com for all the latest news and schedule info for the live show hosted by Big Bill Graham, which is once a month. The EMAG, which we're always looking for uh, for anybody that wants to go ahead and write an article. You guys don't need to know how to write. Uh, JD does a great job with editing and stuff like that and being in touch with you to go ahead and uh, be able to get your articles published. Um, and you can sign up for the subscription link to be emailed to you. Um, plus, the, uh, and I also like to uh, don't uh, not to forget about the new and improved presentations of Gino, Barry, Mike, and the uh, tech shows, and the uh, moderated presentations with uh, Dude, Gino, and me, Troy. And the Thursday night general hangouts with Johnny Reb of Southeast Rails. Um, tonight, I'd like to go ahead and welcome uh, Bill, the track planner. Tonight, we're going to be discussing car cars and way bills. So, if you want to go ahead and take it away, there, Bill. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, when I did the show in January, uh, we touched on this car card way bill uh, situation a little bit, and I promised everybody that. I would do a show on it, so I put together kind of a PowerPoint presentation here. This is a system that I use. It's You're going to see my old system, and then you're going to see my new system that I'm developing now. And, that, and uh, it's uh, I gave this program to my uh, club last Thursday night. It's kind of a trial run. It went over pretty well. So we're going to do a screen share here. We're going to go to the program. Uh, I'm going to go through the program. If you want to ask a question in the middle of it, uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, do that. Uh, I can stop at any point and try to answer questions. It'll probably take about uh, 25 to 35 minutes to go through this, depending on how much we talk about separate slides and everything. So I'm going to do a screen share, and then I need to have everybody tell me if they can see what I've got. Can everybody see it? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, can you see it change screens? Yep. yep sure do. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, the first, the first slide here is a disclaimer. I, I just want people to understand this is my way of doing it. This is not the only way to to move cars over a layout. Uh, I, I know that there's a, a group here in the uh, YouTube community that uh, likes the JMRI operations. I I kind of understand it. I don't use it. Uh, I use this car card and waybill system, and there's, I think, some real advantages to it, which we're going to talk about tonight. But again, please understand, guys, this is just my way of doing things. There. Okay. We kind of got a table of contents here. What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about choosing a car forwarding system, the pros and cons, pre-planning, and pre-planning is the big thing. I, uh, you have to Think about your layout. You got to think about the industries on your layout, the trains that are running, how you're going to move cars, what about car routing, and then I'm going to go through and show you my old car card and waybill system, my new system that I use, and then I'll show you at the end. I'll show you a little bit about my old train and engine card system and the new one that I'm developing there. Okay, choosing a system. You basically you can do probably two ways. You can do car cards and waybills, or you can do switch lists. Um, the car cards and waybills, Micromart is probably the one everybody recognizes first. It's, it's handwritten. It's a fairly inexpensive, about $40. I think you can get started with the kit they've got. Um, it's, it's, it's fine. I, I operate on a layout that uses the Micromart system, and it works very well. Uh, you can do computer generated. Uh, Ship it is one that comes to mind, which is a lot like JMRA's operation. I happen to use a program called Shinware there, which we'll talk we'll talk quite a bit about tonight. And then I also you can you can actually develop a system using Word and Excel. You can design your own, which I've kind of done with my car cards. The so switch list is uh, just a different way of doing it. Uh, you can hand write your own switch list. Some people do that. Uh, most will use a computer generated program like JMRI's operations or ship it. And there's actually, I've seen a couple out there where guys have developed very sophisticated Excel spreadsheets that create switch lists and that. 
Okay. This, I'm going to blow this up just a little bit here to try to give you a little better picture of what's going on. The page on the right is simply a sheet of paper, 11, 8 and a half by 11, and that's what ship it prints out for you. It prints out with the train and the towns the train goes through and what it does in each town. On the right is the waybills that I develop, that I print out, and that, and this is this is a waybill for one car. And what you're looking at on that is two, two sides. The top is the first side. You flip it over 180 degrees, uh, and that you use the second side. We're going to talk all about that a little later in the program here. But this is basically the, the two types of systems: the switch list and the waybill system. There. They, they, they actually, the interesting thing about them, they, they really tell you the same thing. You're, you're kind of getting the same information on both of these here. Uh, it's just a different way of presenting it. And, and again, I'm, I'm real partial to the one on the right. There's nothing wrong on the left except a couple things that I'll talk about here. Okay, Shenandoah Software. This is the one that I use. They sell a program which we'll be showing you here that actually makes the, the way bills. They also will sell you a program that will make these car cards. I don't use their car card program. I develop my own car card uh, system where I, I do my own with pictures of the cars on them and everything. And we'll go through and talk about that in a little bit. But the Shenandoah Software Company, and at the end of this uh, presentation, I've got a page that has all of these things I'm talking about in their website link. So at the end of the in the presentation, you'll be able to see a lot of these companies and things that we're going to be talking about here. Okay, pros and cons of using car cards and way bills. The pros, and the one I've got at the top is self-correcting. That is the biggest pro about car cards and way bills, and it's the actually it's the biggest detriment to a switch list. Switch list guys, what happens with those is computer generated. You have an operating session, the cars move, and then for the next operating session, you go into the computer and you tell it to generate a new set of switch, uh, switch lists for you. The problem with that is the computer assumes that the cars got spotted in the last operating session where they're supposed to go. Well, it's I've operated with ship it on a couple layouts, and one layout we move, we move over 300 cars in an operating session, and invariably one or two cars will have gotten misspotted in the previous op session. You can't believe how hard it is to try and go find a couple of those cars when you when this is a huge layout. It's in a room 50 by about 25, and uh, it, it's it's not easy looking through 300 cars to find the one that got misspotted because the program, whether it's JMRI's operations or it's ship it, it's, it just assumes the car is in the right location. With car cards and waybills, you don't have to worry about that. If somebody spots a car at the wrong industry, no big deal because what's going to happen between that op session and the next one is that car that waybill is going to get flipped. And it's going to get turned over in its car card pocket, and that car is going to move maybe in the next session, and it'll self-correct itself. So that's a big, big thing. Uh, there, it, you, you can you can spot them, but eventually the car will go to the right locations. It'll it'll self-correct. The startup costs are very low. Uh, again, you can get the you can get a whole kit from Micromart for I think around forty dollars, someplace like that. You can make car cards and waybills as simple or as super detailed as you want. I kind of go in between on mine. What I really like about the system is I can color code things. And color coding and putting pictures on really helps your operators when they're running trains. The cons on it, you really have to have a pretty good understanding of railroad operations. Uh, you, have to, you have to understand how the railroads ran. Uh, you have to establish a car routing system, and that's really kind of like a train routing system, uh, and that's really important. I'll touch on that a little more later here in this program. Uh, it takes time to fill out the waybills. I don't care if we're using a computer or you're writing them down by hand. It's going to be time consuming. You just can't get away from that. Some people don't like to have these pocket holders on the fascia of their bench work. They sometimes think they stick out too far. Personally, I don't think it's a big issue, but you have to have some kind of holder to hold these uh, 
these car cards and way bills. And I use a very uh, sophisticated inventory system that uh, I'm, I'm kind of a database geek, and I use a real sophisticated uh, inventory system. Uh, it's not a must, but it's something that I do because I'm kind of anal on things. Okay, biggest thing is pre-planning. That's the that's the thing that you have to sit down and do. And there's thing, a lot of things you got to think about. Let's do the layout first. Number one, is the track plan conducive to operations? Uh, do you have the staging yards? Do you have classification yards? You, know, you got passing sightings. You got interchange tracks. You got branch lines. What kinds of industries are you doing? And, and there's many things you got to you got to think about. Is is this layout conducive to to hold operations on? What kind of railroad do you have? Have you got a big class one railroad that may have double main lines? Have you got a kind of a bridge route type of layout? Maybe a small branch line, a transfer uh, layout that just transfer cars from one one yard to a, some other yard, some other railroad's yard. Uh, single purpose layouts. Those are logging layouts, uh, things like that. Um, you got to think about the commodities that are being sh being shipped and received. It's a, that's a two way uh, street there. Um, general, is it general merchandise? Is it coal? Is it grain? Is it intermodal? Is it lumber or refrigerated goods? Is it a combination of all of these? A lot of it depends on the kind of layout that you're building. These are all things you have to start. You have to think about when you start setting up your car cards and way bills. The industries that you've got. These are things you've got. You need to do. You need to sit down and make a list of all the online industries by type the type of industry it is. You need to list the track capacities for each of those on layout industries. How many cars can you park on a, on a, on a spur? The type of cars each industry will use or need. And don't think for a minute that that's really simple because they say, well, I got a, grain, I got a feed mill. They're just going to need box cars to ship feed out of it. Well, no. Well, I'm going to explain a little later using that scenario how You've got to come up with even thinking about more things than just their moving feed and that they're shipping feed out. Uh, make a list of the off layout industries. Now, that may sound pretty dumb to do that, but uh, I'm kind of anal again. I like to have my car cards saying if I've got a car that's going to move into staging, I just don't say that it's moving into staging. I actually have it going to some industry that's completely off the layout, but it, it adds more realism to this car card way bill system. Make a list of all the products that can be shipped by each industry and all the products that are received by each industry. And also you got to think about the frequency. How often do the, do the commodities get shipped or received? Do the trains drop cars off daily? Do they drop them off every other day, weekly? A lot of the uh, oper train layouts I operate on out here in Colorado, uh, there are sometimes cars that don't move for two, two sessions. Uh, before the car will move, and it was planned that way. The uh, the owner of the layout de designed it that way. Every car doesn't move every op session. Okay, the trains. How many trains are you going to run? Maximum length of each train. That's kind of important, especially when you got a staging yard and you got you got to know how how big you can make your trains and how uh, what's the you know what's the longest train you can have running into staging. The types of trains. You need to make a list of all the different trees, merchandise, coal, locals, turns, extras, so on, so on. When and how do the trains run? Do they run by timetable and train orders, track warrants, sequentially? Do some trains run more than once per op session? Some trains will need to run before other trains run. There, you got, you got to think about, about that when you're doing this. And one of the big things is keeping the yard from getting clogged up. I, I have a famous thing that I ask people. I say, uh, how many how many cars percentage wise does it take to clog up a yard? And you'll I constantly get answers back. Oh, 75 to 80 percent. If you get it that full, you maybe got it clogged up. The rule of thumb is if there's more than if the yard is more than 50 percent full, it's clogged up. There. You want to try to never have a yard that has more than 50% of its capacity because it gets very hard to switch and sort cars if you've got too many sitting in the yard. Okay, I and this is off of my old layout that I had uh, that has since been dismantled. 
I did everything in a sequential uh, way, and we're gonna. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit. You'll see across the top it says type of train, train direction, or, or uh, originates to, from, and terminates. And then you see the type of trains. You see the list of turns, through freights, and locals. Those were the three kind of trains that I ran on my on my previous layout. And what we would do with this list like this is I would say I had three operators operating that night. Each one of the, we'd have a yard master, and then say we had four. We had a yard master and three guys running trains uh, on the layout. I would just start at the top and take those first three and give each one of the guys one of those trains. And I would tell them, okay, whoever finishes running their train first, come back to me and we'll give you the next train. And then we'll give you the next one of that. We just sequentially went through this list. And as you can see, uh, in an off session, we would run about 16 trains on my layout, and that equated to about a four to four and a half hour off session. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about these types of trains because it really will help you maybe understand a little better why we designate different types of trains. I think everybody kind of understands what a through freight is. On my layouts, the through, the through freights literally went from staging to staging. As a matter of fact, if you look at number two, it originated in West staging. It ended up in the Montana Rail Lake staging that I had. You go look at any other freight down here. Here's one that originated in West staging. It ended up uh, terminating in East staging. So the through freights simply ran from staging to staging, and all they did on the layout is they stopped at the main yard that I had on the layout. They had cars, cars in their consist that needed to be dropped off at that yard that they were going someplace else, and there were cars in that yard that this train needed to pick up. And you take number two on the list there, that was train 292, which was an eastbound train that ran uh, from uh, Eugene, Oregon to Great Falls, Montana. That was actually the, the route that I had it run. There. So West staging represented Eugene, and Montana Rail Lake staging represented Great Falls there. This particular train stopped at my, uh, at, in Lewiston, Idaho, at my main yard, dropped off whatever cars the car card said to drop off, but I can also guarantee you there were X number of cars in that yard that needed to go out on the next eastbound freight there, so the yard master would put cars in there. So I always had it set up so that if we were dropping off five or six or seven cars, they were usually picking up anywhere from four to six to seven cars there so they they kind of come in with X number of cars and they kind of left that kind of kept a balance in the yard what's a local do or let's go to a turn that's that's a little simpler to think about turns originate in the yard in my case it was Lewiston yard they went somewhere to do some work but then they came back to Lewiston yard number one up here was what I called the PT turn which was the potlash paper mill run it originated in Lewiston, in the Lewiston yard. It ran over to the potlash paper mill. It did its work, and then it came back to the Lewiston yard. That's where you get the term turn. It went out, turned, and came back, did its work there. And all those you see in blue were turns, and if you look, if you look at what they did, that's exactly what they did. They started in Lewiston. They terminated in Lewiston. Locals are a little different. Locals can do a lot of, they can do different things. In my instance, the way I usually had mine set up for my locals is they either originated in Lewiston Yard or they ended up in Lewiston Yard. But they could originate anywhere. If you look at number three on the list, that originated in Bend, Oregon, which is really was West Staging for me there, and uh, it terminated in Lewiston Yard. There, and when I say terminated, it does terminate. That 252 terminated in Lewiston Yard and was done running and it left all its cars there. Now, later in the off session, if you went down a ways, there was a 251 that ran back westbound, which was basically the same train, it was just a westbound train, that would go back into staging, into west staging, with cars that it picked up in Lewiston Yard. Then I simply would flip the waybills, and that, that train would turn into 252 in the next off session, and we would just repeat what we just did. But, Again, this is, this is the system that I used uh, for, oh, probably a couple dozen off sessions we held on my layout uh, before I tore it down. 
and uh, using again just three types of trains through freights turns and locals okay I hope everybody that makes sense to everybody there hopefully you understand that so far okay um, I'm trying Jimmy um, pre planning car movements how and when do cars move or don't move well in a car card way bill system the car is totally dependent on what the way bill says there one of the things we do uh, out here and I they do it in a lot of lot of operating sessions that use this system if you've got a car sitting at an industry and maybe it was dropped off of that industry in the last op session there and you don't want it to move for maybe you want to skip the next op session not have it move you simply would take your car card and way built and you would turn it backwards in that box so that the the person that was operator that was switching that particular industry or town if he seen any of those uh, way bills and car cards that were turned backwards they knew that car didn't move that car stayed at that uh, siding for this particular op session now it was up to the owner of the layout to go back and if he wanted to move the next op session then he'd have to flip it around and put it back so that it was facing forward Controlling car movements. Uh, dispatcher and yard masters always need to coordinate together. Now, on some layouts, the dispatcher and yard master is the same person. On other layouts, they're actually two different people. On my layout, I was I never ran a train when I held off sessions. I was always the dispatcher. I told everybody when trains were supposed to run. We had a yard master that did nothing but sort cars in the yard, and he controlled the yard. You have to balance car movements. Uh, what's the right number of cars to move during an off session? What's the right times to move the cars? And again, you need to do kind of figure all this out so you don't overload the yards with cars. Yeah. And again, understand, guys, I'm talking about this in the realm of car cards and waybills. All of this holds true if you're using JMRI's operations. You still got to think the same way about these things. Okay, this is the most important one. This is the car route. Again, how and when do cars move on the layout? Are on layout industries shippers or receivers, or are they both? You, you, you can have some, some of your industries where they only ship out. They don't receive anything. Or you can have industries that can do both. Those are the, you got to think about that. Does the car move from one online industry to another? Uh, some I, I'm not a big fan of doing it that way, but uh, some layouts you have no choice. You, that's how you have to operate them. If the car moves off layout to staging, how does it happen? When I say how does it happen, which train does the car move off the layout on? Does it move eastbound or westbound, or north or south, depending on how your layouts are oriented? Does it the, does it move to an interchange with another railroad? Does it move as a priority shipment or something less? When I say priority shipment, that would a good example would be me mechanical or iced reefers as opposed to a coal train. Coal trains are always they're they're kind of the, the low end of the totem pole as far as trains go. Coal trains move when there's no other traffic moving on the layout. If you're using kind of a hierarchy system, um, are there are there special instructions where cars need to be placed in the train? The example: If you've got a um, a gas train or an oil train. You need to put a, a bumper, a buffer car in between the engines and the rest of those cars. It's just a safety factor. So you got to think about that. And how do how do we now? That sounds all pretty pretty complicated and pretty you know pretty tough to do. So how do we make the routing simpler? Well, we're going to look at this next slide here. I belong to a group that's called Operations Special Interest Group. They call it OpSig. They come out with a magazine four times a year that deals totally with operations, prototypic operations. If you're a member of this group, uh, one of the benefits is they have these spreadsheets, and they have about five of these. And these are, these are, are, are de designed by uh, areas of the country. This one here happens to be for the western part of the United States. And basically what it is, it takes from Montana through Wyoming, through Colorado, through New Mexico, and then everything west of there. That's when you look at that first column, and I'll blow this up a little bit here. You see it says W. Well, that's for west. 
This is this is the database that is basically the Western United States. The information here is great. The era of the industry, and you see if it's 9999, that means they don't really know. But you see 1950s, 1982. You see all these these dates. These were real industries. These these actually did exist. These are not just somebody made these up. The industry, where what city it was in, what state it was in, what railroad serviced it, was it a shipper or a receiver or both, and what was the commodity that it shipped. Now this is inside of an Excel spreadsheet, and if, if you know how to work Excel spreadsheets, you can sort this information any way you want to sort it there. Now the key to this is these is this spreadsheet right here that you're looking at just for the Western United States. There are over 10,000 entries into this one spreadsheet right here. There's 10,000 industries that are listed in here. How do I use this? This is where I get my my industries that my cars are leaving the layout and going to. This is this is where I pick it. And I just highlighted a few of these just for the fun of it. I, and I, I want to show you this one here, the second one down that's highlighted. It's if you look over at the commodities over there, it says toilet paper. Well, I had that potlash paper mill on my layout, and one of the buildings on the potlash paper mill actually manufactured and produced toilet paper. So naturally, I got a I've got a building that we're shipping toilet paper out of. We got to ship it somewhere. It's got to go somewhere. Well, I found this one in this list. There was a Safeway store warehouse in Vernon, California, that received toilet paper. So on my car cards, that's what. On my excuse me, on my way bills, that's what I put on there. That that car went from the potlash paper mills toilet paper plant to the Safeway store there. Just to add realism. This, this just added realism to the layout. But you have to understand the spreadsheet is 10,000. And the neat thing about it is you can take any one of these columns and you can sort. So you could go in and you could say, show me all of them that, that companies did toilet paper. I think I did that one time and I think it came up out of 10,000 with about five, five different industries that either shipped or received toilet paper. There. So, so when you when you were running an operating session on this and these cars are going to the Safeway stores from on the layout going to off layout to staging, now how do your operators know that that is an off layout section that, well, those, that that cart there is going to? They don't necessarily know that. What, how I do this, and I'll show you this in a, in a minute here. That'll, that's a great question, Joy. That'll come up. It, the cars get shipped by, when you think back on a couple slides, I said, what train does the car go into? Well, this particular car, I, I can tell you exactly what happened with this one here. Um, it, it first, because it was, a, it, it was at the potlash, the potlash paper mill, it, that car first would run on the, on the uh, potlash turn, which meant that the car left potlash paper mill on the, on the potlash turn, went over to Lewiston Yard, got dropped off in Lewiston Yard. Then what happened is the way bill got turned, and it said that the car needed to go on a westbound freight. So the way I, I ran my off sessions, well, why would it go on a westbound? Because I was in Idaho there, in Lewiston, Idaho, the, the car needs to go to Vernon, California. Well, the way I had my layout set up was if there was room in the next westbound through freight that came through Lewiston Yard, that car went on it. There, there. Okay. And what the yard master would do is he would sort cars in the yard so that if, say, there were cars going to uh, Seattle, or there were cars going to San Diego, or there were cars going any place west of, of uh, Lewiston, Idaho, they would sort those cars on a track where all those cars would go out on the next westbound. And when that westbound was coming through a uh, Lewiston yard, what would happen would be is if they were dropped off, because every, every one of my trains had a set number of cars, that it could have in it. A lot of them were 14 to 17 cars because of the size of the staging yard tracks. You know, the capacity of those tracks, that's what you had to limit. So suppose a train come in and it had, it had 17 cars on it, but the staging track it was going to would only hold 14 cars and it was dropping off 
say three or four cars, well that meant you could only put in a couple more cars into that train. Well that was the yard master's job to know that and figure out how many cars to put in there and this could be one of the cars. Now what happened when this got to got into staging? Then that way bill got flipped because that car did go to the Safeway store uh, theoretically there. So between off sessions I would flip that way bill and then what would, the, what would the other side of the way bill say? It would say we've got an empty here that now needs, goes, that needs to go back to the potlash paper mills toilet uh, building, toilet paper uh, manufacturing building, and that car would end up back at the same place it was during the next op session. And then the whole process would just start over again. Now the great thing about car cars and the way bills is if you get tired of watching, like this would have been a box car that this would have been shipped in, if you got tired of watching the same box car going back and forth over a series of op sessions, just take the way bill and pull it out of that box car and put it in a different box car. Now you got a different box car doing the same thing there. So that's what I like about the system. But there's again, think about that. There's 10,000 entries just in this one one database, and and if you belong to this group, I think it's five da five databases for different parts of the of the United States. There. Okay, we can come back to this later. Let's go on here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you my old system here, the old one that I used to use. It's it's pretty rough. It's uh, wasn't pretty, but it did work. Okay, here were my car cards and way bills. I build them myself. There, uh, the car card. The excuse me, yes, the car card was simply a 65 pound piece of paper that I ran through my laser printer, and it printed the information you have seen there. Uh, XM means a box car. I had the word box car if people didn't know what it meant. Uh, it was an SP box car that had that number on it. It was brown and it was a 40 footer. That was all the information that you really needed on there. What was inside there that went inside that pocket was uh, the way bill. And you see, part of it is printed and part of it is handwritten. I need to explain that because it, it tells you a lot about how, how you, the mind works with colors and that. If you look at the rooting, where it says root down there, you see that it says CJ242LE-BI. I'll blow that up a little bit. What that really meant was that that train ran on the uh, CJ turn, which was a, a train that ran on my layout. When it left the layout, it was actually go out, leave the layout on 242, which was an eastbound train there that would have ran from Lewiston, Idaho to Billings, Montana there. And this train here, uh, it was an eastbound that, excuse me, ran, uh, I shouldn't say Billings, I keep thinking BL, that ran to actually to Bloomington, uh, Minnesota there. So, and you can see by where the car was, it was at the uh, Johnson Feed and Grain in Nespers, Idaho, and it was going to the Hiawatha Mill in Minneapolis. So you pick the car up at Johnson Feed Mill by the CJ turn, you put it over in Lewiston Yard, it got picked up by train 242, which was going to Bloomington, Minnesota, and eventually it would have made its way to the uh, Hiawatha Mill in Minneapolis. Now, it, it, that's the theory. What really happened, it, the car just went into staging, and in 242, there, it's also farther it went. I had to add those colors at the top of that because it was hard for my operators to kind of think about those little letters down there, CJ242, LE-BL. So what I did is I added these colors to it and instantly everything got much easier for the operators. They, 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 I had this kind of the same operators every month running and they pretty soon knew what the colors meant. So it was real simple. So this is, this is where I'm a big fan of colors. And you'll see that on my new system, how I, how I do use the coloring system and that. On there, but this is my old car card and way bill system. There's the uh, the the little pockets that I put on the front fascia of the layout, and there you see some of the car cards and way bills in those in those packets. There, I'm going to take a drink here for a second, guys. There's a question here from uh, Go ahead. Muskoka Steve. <laughs> Would you flip any waybills during an op session, like a through freight that goes into staging? Would you flip the waybills and send it back out later in that session? Uh, very seldom did I have once on my layout. 
uh, be, be, the problem I had with my layout, the one that this is all off of, was all of my staging was stub end. So at the beginning of an off session, you had all of your trains lined up to come out onto the railroad. The problem was is when a train ran and it ran into staging, it ran in so that the engine was, was clear in at the stub end of it. It would have been too hard to turn the train around and have it come back out. So on my layout, every train ran one time there. It, uh, it, 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 come, it could have come from staging, went to the other staging, but once it did that, it was done for that off session. And then what I had to do, and that's the reason I don't have stub in staging anymore, I've gone to double-ended staging, is what I would have to do between off sessions is I would have to go to each one of those staging areas and flip the trains. I didn't have to flip the cars, but I had to move the engines to the other end and the caboose to where the engine was. Now that train was flipped around and it was ready to come out for the next session, but we never done that during an op session. We only did it between op sessions. So hopefully that answers answers this question there. Okay, and what about a, a, a staging area that's that's uh, self realigning like mine is? Okay, then you then you can do it if you want to. A, a good example of that where you can do that very easily and, and it's, it's somewhat prototypical and, and you were, you got a passenger train and you got a, you got a westbound passenger train, you got double-ended staging, well that train could come back out if it, if it turns itself around on a reverse loop or something, that could have been a westbound train and it can get itself turned around and come back as an eastbound train later in the op session. That, that happens, I, I see that happen on some of the layoffs I operate on. That can happen. but. I like the idea of trains running once per session. If you think about it, that's what trains do in the real world. There, they just and if you've got if you've got enough staging tracks and you have enough places to do this, like it, like I showed you earlier, guys. Remember, we ran 16 trains in an off session, and that took four to four and a half hours. You don't want to have off sessions run over four and a half hours. Guys get too tired. And that, and uh, so a four, uh, anything from a three to a four to four and a half hour op session is about as much as you want to do on that. But again, this is my old system. This was the one that I, and and we use this for many, many, many uh, op sessions, and, and it it worked. It, it absolutely worked. Well, let's show you the new system here. Let's show you what I'm. I do I'm gonna break in here really quick just to. Uh, Remind all the viewers to keep checking YouTube Model Builders website at youtubemodelbuilders.com for all the latest news and schedule for the info for the live show hosted by Big Bill Graham, which is once a month. The eMag, which is bi-monthly, and viewers can sign up for the subscription link to be emailed to you. Plus, the eMag is always looking for uh, for people to go and send in all their their articles and stuff, and you don't have to worry about writing or anything or punctuation. Uh, JD does a great job on, on doing all that stuff for you, so you, you really don't have to worry about anything like that. Um, and not to forget about the uh, all the pres presentations with Gino, Barry, and Mike, uh, and Dude and I. And the Thursday night general hangouts with Johnny Reb of Southeast Rails, which is uh, also really fun to go ahead and get up in up on. Okay, sorry about that, Bill. Oh, that's fine. I'll give me a break. I appreciate that. That was great. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the new system that I've developed. First of all, this is my database here, and this is one I developed. Uh, every car that is going to be on my layout, and I haven't, this is for my new layout, my new Spokane, Portland, Seattle layout. I've got about 100 and some cars, but it, I've only got about uh, uh, a third of them in, into this database yet. But this is a database that I create that uh, I, gives me the cars. I take the picture. The picture goes in here. If you look at the bottom of the screen here, you see a little thing that says Find, View, and Print. That's a button that I push. And when I push that button, it prints the car card for me. Not the way bill, just the car card is what I get out of this here. But I use this uh, database for other things besides just printing car cards. I have an inventory list of cars here that I have and this this is the same information that you've just seen on that other slide just in a different format. What I do with this is if I'm going to a train show and I'm, I think I need to buy some more cars, I print this out and I throw this in my back pocket and I take it with me and if there's a car I'm looking at and I go, gee do I have that car already in my inventory? Because I'm a real big 
geek on not having different numbers on all my cars. I don't want two cars with the same numbers on them. Well, I can go right, pull this out of my pocket, take a look at this, and I know if I have that car already. And I can sort this any way I want to sort it by anything I want to do. But this is, this is just a report that I use that comes out of that database. This is what I'm making. Now, this is done. I do this myself using this database program. This creates my car card for me there. Uh, as you see, it's a pretty simple format, and it's very easy to, to identify the car. I just use, guys, a point-and-shoot camera to take the pictures of the car. Again, I'm using a 65-pound paper stock. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that, and I, should, I shouldn't do that. I really shouldn't. When you see that empty car return to that you see on there, that gets covered up by the uh, way bill that gets in there. So if you have a car that doesn't have a way bill in it, that means the car is empty and it has no place to go. So what that tells it, in this particular instance, this car here, if it didn't have any place to go on its last run, uh, the operator is supposed to take that car from wherever it was sitting back to Lewiston Yard. And then it would sit on a track of a bunch of empties. And then if the uh, yard master got an order for a grain card for someplace on the layout, Okay, you look at the look at the the track that had all the empties on it. Oh, here I got a I got a I got a UP grain hopper here. Uh, we can use that. So then they pick that up, put a way bill in it, and the car would go out. This this measures two and an eighth inches by six and a half. Why does it measure that? I take the bottom, I fold the bottom up so that it lines up with this line right here, and the way bills that you're going to see here in just a minute that I build. They print on a business uh, business card size card is what they do about a two inch by three inch uh, business card. So after I print this, I just fold this up right up to this line there, and then how do I attach it? This is the, I did, I'm not smart enough to figure this stuff out, but a good friend of mine did. What you see right here is just a clear mailing label. I buy those clear mailing labels and. It just wraps around after I make that fold, and that creates my pocket for my uh, way bill that will fit inside this car cart there. And, that, and uh, I, can, I can go through all this information here, but I think most of you guys understand what all that stuff means. It's just identifiers for the cars. Putting the pictures on these uh, car cards, you cannot believe how easy that makes it for your operators to to find the car they need to work with and that, so instead of having to look at numbers. Now some people say that's not very prototypical. Well that's okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. I want to make it easy for the operators to, uh, to find the cars they need to do something with. Okay, here's the program that makes my way bills. And I'll show you the way bills after this screen. This is, uh, and I'll have this at the end of the, uh, the presentation here so you can, you'll get this, you can get the website and everything. This is, a, this is the same thing, guys, as JMRA's operation, but it's a little simpler. It doesn't look like it by the pictures there, but it's a little simpler, and it's, it's basically point and shoot. This is where you, the information goes in that, for printing the way bill, but you have to understand that it's all point and click. If you uh, want to put a, uh, a, a city to or an industry to, you would already have them in, and you would just click on one, and it would drop it in. The, the salmon-colored box around that first one shows that that's active. All this information over here, you put in ahead of time, except this down here. And this is the commodities listing, and this is built into the program. This, is, this comes with one. And you can add commodities to it, too. But there's, there's, a, there's a thousand or more commodities already built into this program that you can use for shipping in that. The colors that you see here, these are low, these are towns. The first, uh, I'll blow this up here. The first column is a, is a town. The second one is uh, the industry inside that town. Uh, there and then is it a shipper or receiver, and what is the commodity? Each town has a different color, and that color gets printed up here at the top of these waybills. Example: I have a town named Camas on the new layout. There. So everything that every industry that's going to be in Canvas, there is going to, is brown. So it'll print this brown up at the top there. That's great for your operator, especially the yardmaster, because when he gets used to the layout, 
he, if he sees that color brown, there's no other color browns that I use, so he knows that car instantly is going to go in a trade that goes to Camus there. Uh, over here you see purple color, which is the Spokane one. So, and these are all the locations where cars can go on my layout. And you, if you notice right here, they have a thing called offline industries. That's kind of the simple, stupid way if you don't want to do what I do by actually finding off, offline industries. You can take and put that into your, I did it on this way bill just to show you. This, this uh, tank car came from Vancouver, Washington, and which is uh, uh, which is offline, it's staging online, and it went to Camas, Washington, to the Camas paper mill, and it was a uh, uh, it was a tank car, and then you can even, down here, you can put in little notes, and this green one you see here is right here, and all I do is click and put that note in there, and it says, it said to spot the tank car at a specific spot when it got to the paper mill. And you can do two-sided waybills, you can do four-sided waybills. And that. And once you get learned in this program, it really goes pretty quick. Yes, there's a lot of setup. Yes, there's a lot of pre-stuff you have to do, which is the same thing you got to do with uh, JMRI's operations or shipment. But here you don't have to, you know, this doesn't ask you a whole stuff, bunch of stuff about, you know, the size of the car and all that stuff you're going to use there. Okay. This is the way bill that it prints. This is what you this is what prints on it. And this again is a business card size printing. And this is all the information that you can print on there. I won't go through it necessarily because it'll take a lot of time. But basically this is a car that was coming from Rapid City, South Dakota. It was going to Spalding, Idaho to the Spalding cement plant. Well if you look at this, if you can read upside down, it's the reverse of what that top says. The car was coming from Spalding Cement. It was empty. It was going back to Rat Rapid City, South Dakota, to the South Dakota uh, cement plant to pick up some more cement, their powder cement, and ship. And as you see, the trains that it ran in, or ran on, excuse me, there. And again, this this was a two-sided way bill, but this is this is what it prints after you get the information keyed in. Okay, my old system for train, car, train and engine cards. And this is really, really kind of uh, antiquated, but again, it worked. It did, it did a job. This was train 281. It was called the Grangeville Local. It originated in Grangeville Staging. It terminated in Lewiston Yard, and it was a local freight. I would have, with a grease pencil, I could put the engine that was going to run the train that day. Did it have a caboose on it? What was the caboose number? And how many cars did it did it start out uh, from Greenville staging with? And then these were the towns that it went through. And I put a quick little note about if it had work to do or didn't have work to do. All the operator had to do was flip this card over and it gave him a detailed description of what he did in each town. There, for example, in uh, Nez Perce, there I had it work with a question mark. What he needed to do was check the consist waybills for any setouts on the on the lead track. There was a lead track in this particular town. He didn't set them out at industry. He set them out on a on a lead track there. But this 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 was all put together by me. There was a, a place called uh, Cul de Sac. There and we used helpers on that because this was at the bottom of a hill that I had, and if you had so many cars, you had to use helpers. Well, at the bottom of the, it was a helper spur is all it was. Well, you had, in this particular train, there was a, a tank car, and you had to check the waybills for a set out of a tank car with diesel fuel in it at the helper spur there. And uh, you also, if you were using helpers with that train, you removed the helpers at that particular spot there. This was a very simple engine car. It was it was engine 5306. It was Burlington Northern. It was a U30C. It was green and black, and the, the, you keyed in the decoder number, which was 06. Back when when I did this, we didn't have a lot of sound sound engines, so about the biggest thing I had was you hit FO to get a light. That was about all you had to do. So what's the, here it shows that all, all those car cards and this engine uh, uh, card put together in a packet, and that's how I, the guys used to carry the packets around on my layout. That's, that's how I would have them 
they would carry them in their pocket or we would have a bib that they would, we would have them wear or something like that. Okay, what's the new system look like? Same thing, new database. And this database is a lot more information. I use Decoder Pro to program all of my all of my engines on my layout. Decoder Pro is, is my choice on that. The same information that gets stored in Decoder Pro, I put in here. Uh, in the decoder information part of this. What type, who's the vendor on the decoder? What's the decoder type? What number did I program into it? When did I modify it? Is the direction forward or reverse? And then these are CV settings that I have it set at. On my layout, uh, no, no engine on my layout runs over a scale speed of 35 miles an hour. That's the maximum of the train. So this particular HD 123 Digitrax decoder I set the maximum voltage at 135, which meant that engine would not run over about 33, 34, 35 miles per hour. It would start at, at, at see, this is CV2, this start voltage here. It would start at, uh, if I, I keyed in 35, and on speed step one on my NC system, that engine would start moving. And then you just kind of come up with a middle number for the middle. But again, this is all information about that particular engine there. Uh, in my in my uh, database, same little button down here to print the engine card if you want to print it. I also had a report. Here's a report, inventory report. Same information you just seen on the other page. Now it's in a report format with the picture of the engine uh, and all the information about each engine that was in there. And then I would print these. This is an older style. I've got a new one I'm working on. It's actually going to have a picture of the engine on the engine card also but it's basically the same thing as the uh, as the car cards for the freight cars this is just for the engines with in, the, in this particular one here this was a train that was 251 with with a one and I think everybody knows that if you have odd numbers on your on your train numbers those are westbounds if you have even number, if, if the number's an even number for the last number, those are eastbound. You always think of it as east even, uh, odd number is westbound. Well, this was a Burlington Northern Freight westbound. It was a through freight, ran from upper staging to lower staging, and it was a westbound freight that stopped at Lewiston Yard to drop off and pick up cars. That was what that train was supposed to do. And there would be the car cart, the engine cart pocket, or the engine card would go right into this pocket here, is what would happen. There's the new one I'm working on because I've got an NCE system and I use, uh, my mine's radio control, but I have no tethering anywhere. Uh, I use small, I don't use the big hammer heads, I use the small NCE handheld throttles that are wireless. And there's a kind of a specific order you have to acquire an engine. So I've created this card. Again, this information is on, in the database for my engine and this is what would go in that card that you've seen in the last slide there. Guys, that's the end. I'll leave that up for a little bit. Those, there, there's your operation special interest group I put at the top, uh, the Shinohara software, MicroMart. Uh, the database program I use is called FileMaker Pro uh, version 14. And then, of course, Ship It is done by a company called Albion Software there if you want to look them up. So, I can, again, I can leave this up on the screen for. Uh, a little bit if you want. I'm done. I'm ready for questions if anybody has any here. Wow. And, uh, you, you. Go ahead. Well, I'm just saying, I hope there's questions because I don't think I did that good a job. Uh, if I might. Um, so how would this apply to a layout that's very, very, very small? What, how could you use this type of system? Well, you can you, you can use it because I, I've uh, recommended it to many of the people I've designed track plans for. Suppose you didn't have, I, I just did one today. I shipped, I'm shipping out tomorrow a, a plan for a gentleman. That, he has a room about the size of gyms. They're, you know, a smaller room, and he has no staging on it. So, but I did add a, a, an extra track where we're going to use that as visible staging. And what I told him to do was to set up so that at the beginning of an op session, there's a train sitting on this track. And it would be the same thing as it was if it was sitting in a hidden staging, and that train runs on the layout. Now, what I do, what I tell people to do with small layouts is 
you can you, you start this train up it might be the first train that runs during the um, during the off session instead of just running it over to the yard and getting getting it to switch one of the things we try to create in operating sessions is time and distance well one of the ways you can create time and distance is you take that train and you let it do two or three laps around your continuous running on your layout like it's been going somewhere or coming from somewhere and then maybe on the third la the third lap around it comes into the yard there we, I, I've recommended that for years and then that's where you would have a small layout with no staging or, or anything like that mm -hmm. at all and it can be done and, okay. and, and you car cards and and uh, and waybills the waybill is the important part of it you, you can set them up for any size layout they aren't specific to it that layout has to be a certain size I like the way you grouped your um, your locomotives on the sheets there. That and take a picture. That was pretty cool. Well, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm anal. <laughs> okay, that's a, so years ago when I was much much younger. Uh, I used to do a little bit of computer programming just from just for my own benefit, and I really got hung up on computer pro and designing databases because yeah, I like spreadsheets. Spreadsheets will do a lot for you, but boy, if you know how to design relational databases. You can get so much information out of them that it's that it's great. So I, it's it's besides playing golf and messing around with track plans, that's the other thing I tend to goof around with is stupid databases and that. So well, as I see your list, your micro marks that you used is the one you did for. Um, let's see. That's that's the company where you do the handwritten car cards and waybills. Okay, what's the one we with you? Will you put the picture of the locomotives and all the information? That on? I designed myself. That's that file maker profile. Oh. Oh, okay. That program, you guys, I don't think you want to buy that because that's a fully relational database program, and the single user version costs three hundred and ninety nine dollars. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, but I, but I, I, I use that when I when I had my business and I was running my business, I use that program. I, I I've actually owned FileMaker Pro from version two till today, and they're now in version fourteen. There, and they only they only. Come out with a new version about every two years. Right. And that. So, uh, but that now you can you can kind of do some of the same stuff if you're good at using uh, Excel. If you know how to use Excel mm -hmm. in kind of a database format and that. But it's uh, again the pictures are the for me and my the way we used to do op sessions on my layout. The pictures made all the difference in the world. Hmm. That, that, that my my yard masters and I and what we would do on my layout is each off session one of the guys we'd have a different yard master because the yard master is the busiest person on the layout he's got trains coming at him from different directions and that's another thing you got to you got to be careful of is your, the order you run your trains because you don't want to get your your yard master completely overwhelmed with trains coming from all different directions you have to space things out a little bit right. yeah. And uh, but uh, as soon as I put those pictures on those on those cards, uh, it made it so, that in the colors. That the the colors is what did it too because mm -hmm. the so you take an example with the yard master. He was making up a train for that I, one you've seen on there. My old one was the C J turn. There was a Craigmont Junction was the name of the town, but we call it the C J turn on layout. Okay, that color was yellow. Well. The yard master, once he knew that, he didn't care if it says CJ turn. He knew if it was yellow, that's where it went. So he didn't even have to read the card on that. He just looked for colors. And then when he made up that train in the yard to make that train up to go out, he just put all the, all the cars that had waybills that had yellow tops on them there, went into that train. Because huh. so, I had a different color for not, I didn't have a different color for every industry. I had a different color. For every city or staging yard. Okay. Now, would you label that on onto the layout either, as far as the the different cities and stuff? Yes, I did. Uh, I, I had I had a I had each each town was labeled there, so uh, the the individual individual knew where to go. Another thing I did on my layout is I had the one I had up at my ranch. I had five towns on the layout. Four towns the trains went to. The fifth town was Lewiston, where the big yard was at. But then I had five towns out on the layout 
what I did is I had the turns go to just one town. I didn't have a turn go out and say go to two turn, go to two towns, which wouldn't be totally prototypical to do that. There's no problem in doing that. But I didn't do that on my layout. I wanted guys. I wanted guys to be running more trains, not less trains. So if you were doing the CJ turn, which was Craigmont Junction, which was a town on my layout, the guy that ran that train went through three other towns before he got to Craigmont Junction, and he did no switching in those towns. He did nothing at all. He just uh, he just went by him and went to Craigmont, did what he was supposed to do in Craigmont, came back to Lewiston. There, did his thing. So. Um. Muskoka Steve asked, does the Shenware software have the database for your cars and engines as well as the Wavebill info? And does the Shenware software cost anything? Shenware, yeah, I think the, they, they, they make two programs. They make the car card program and they make the Wavebill. They're separate programs that you buy. I, I've owned this one for so long, I don't even remember what it cost. I think it's around a $50 program. I think the car card and I think the way bill, I think they're both about the same price, but you know, it's good marketing. They, they sell two separate programs. So you've got to buy one for each. I learned by, because of this FileMaker pro software that I use, I learned how to build my own car cards. So I didn't need to buy their car card system, but I love their data, their way bill system. Now the way bills understand they have nothing to do. You can do engines. You can do engines inside of that way bill system and do engine cards in there. Uh, I don't use it that way, but you could. Um, you, you, you could actually print your, I, I think you can, I'm trying to remember for sure, about, so I'm not telling the stories here. I think you can print engine cards also out of that system there. And, uh, but you have, you have to put your information <clears throat> for your railroad in there. Now, for the people that don't know, what is the actual difference between a car card and a waybill? Okay, that's fine. Let's, let's go back. Let me, I'm going to click back here, guys. Okay. That's a waybill. And this is what tells you what the car is going to do. I, I won't go through this here uh, because people, it's, it's a good question. I, I, I have a tendency to assume things, and I really shouldn't do that. Okay. First thing this tells you is this is the first it's the first cycle of this waybill. This waybill can have two cycles, it can have four cycles. They're depending on how you want to set it up. I'm going to click back here for just a second. Depending on how you want to set it up inside of this program determines whether you end up with a two-sided or a uh, a four-sided waybill there. So, this is a this is the first side. This is this is a for the Spalding turn, this train is going to Spalding, Idaho. This particular car card is for a uh, grain hopper. There, this waybill, and it's going to go. It's going to it's going to route through Lewiston Yard. It's going to Spalding, Idaho, to the Spalding cement plant. It's coming from South Dakota, Rapid City, South Dakota, from the South Dakota cement plant, and it contains cement dry cement inside of it. This what this little thing you see right here that and all these things are optional. When I say they're optional, you can you can put as much information on this way bill as you want or you as little information. But this is telling you what the car is supposed to do, where it's supposed to go, where it's coming from. This little plane here, the C L I C, that stands for car location inventory control. Now this is really getting in the weeds here, guys. And I, I shouldn't be doing this, but in the real world, it's a six it's a six digit number that the railroads have separated. It's two numbers dash, two numbers dash, two numbers. And what that number does is it tells the operator not only what industry, not excuse me, not only what town to spot that car in, it tells it what industry, and then the third number is which door, if there's doors that you spot the car at. And it's just a series of numbers. Well, I don't, as anal as I am, I'm not going to get that far into the weeds. So all I did here for my car location thing, I just put in SP, which which was abbreviation for Spalding. That's all it was there. Well, well, what happened with this car 
on the on this if it moved in this particular off session, this car would be in Lewiston Yard there because what happened to it the operating session before it it came from it it came from on a UP westbound. Now you don't this says eastbound. Well, it doesn't. You don't have to put that on there. What happened is this car card was flipped when this car was in staging um, on the operate on the session before. It got into Lewiston Yard. It got pulled out at Lewiston Yard from a westbound uh, UP for, uh, through freight because it had to go to Spalding there, so it got pulled out of the train. Now, what's going to happen to it now? It's sitting over in Spalding at the cement plant. The next operating session, or between the operating sessions, I'm going to flip this waybill. This waybill is going to flip. Now, this car is still sitting at Spalding Cement, but the waybill has been flipped. And now it says that this car is empty. The, the cement's been unloaded out of it. There, it's going to go from the Spalding Cement Plant, where it's at right now, to the Rapid City one in South Dakota. Well, this, this car needs to go out on a UP eastbound freight. So that that is flipped. And so what happens when the Spalding turn runs the next time? When the guy gets to Spalding, he sees that this car needs to be picked up, taken over to Lewiston Yard. And then eventually it'll go out on an eastbound uh, UP freight. I I had through I had two types of through freights on my layout. I had I had BN freights through freights and I had UP through freights. So I would I would where I, depending on where the car was going to go, I would put in whether it was UP or Burlington. This one just happened to be it went on a UP eastbound. Now that was going to staging. So when that when that train and that car ended up in staging. Between that that off session and the next one, I flipped the card back again, and it came up and said this: the card just repeated what it had done two off sessions ago. Than that, so if the waybills tell you where the cars are going. The car card is simply identifies the car that you're going to use there. Again, this 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 was a this needed a hopper car. LO was for hopper. That was the type of car it needed. So. Here's a hopper car that they could have used to, to move um, uh, cement in and that, and this would have been a car that would have been appropriate for that particular car movement there. Now, if it was a cement plant and you can only put, you would only wanted to use uh, 40, uh, 43 foot uh, cement hoppers, okay, you could put that information on on the waybill. The waybill would could have that or miss it. You could, you know, a little note here. Only, only use cement hoppers to to move. Don't use anything else. And then that would have been totally appropriate too. But the car, the car card identifies the cars. The waybill identifies where the car is going to or coming from. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally. Yeah. 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 Now, I hopefully I'm putting anybody to sleep yet. I hope. Oh no! I've learned a lot. Yeah, it's good education here. Well, it's a uh, it, as you guys have figured out with me now. Uh, for me, it's all about operations. I, I this hobby would hold no interest in it at all if it wasn't for operations, and that moving trains and doing things. I think it adds I, a whole other aspect to having a having a layout and actually doing something with it. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, uh, let me cite you. I, I just, I just, two weeks ago, yeah, I think it was two weeks ago, I operated on a layout that is 1,500 square foot, fills up a full basement in this gentleman's house. There, we, we, and this is how he runs his operating sessions. The whole layout is run by a dispatcher. The dispatcher actually sits in his garage in a dispatcher's booth that he built in the garage. The dispatcher isn't even where the layout is. Isn't even the same room there. And this guy spends four and a half hours out there dispatching trains on this layout. With no bathroom breaks, by the way. Um, we're tough. We're tough out here. So what ha what he what we would do is we sit, we being in the operators would sit in a crew lounge with a phone and the dispatcher out in the garage, the phone would ring. Somebody would grab the phone and we would say, crew lounge, 
and the dispatcher would say, let me talk to Bill Moronic. So they would give me the phone. He would say to me, Bill, you're going to need to run uh, train 282 at, at 1 o'clock. Sitting on a shelf in the crew lounge is a fast clock, a, a, a 4 to 1 fast clock. And he would give me the train I'm supposed to run and what time it's supposed to leave uh, staging or wherever it is. My job then was to go find the train card that explained exactly what that train was going to do and then about 15 minutes in fast time, which is like about five minutes before, I would go down and find that train and I had all the information I needed. There was, we, we used car card, we used this system, matter of fact, on that layout car card label system. And I would pick that train up and I would run that train. When I did what I was supposed to do with that train and I got it parked, let's say, and say it was a through freight, I got it parked in another staging yard. This, this layout has five staging yards on it, by the way, and, uh, and four helixes built into this thing. But when I would get that train finished doing its job, I was in. I I was in. Well, how his is set up is uh, that one train I ran. I left Seattle and I ended up in Chicago. So when I ended up with the train in Chicago on in staging, then I call the dispatcher and I tell him that train 282 is tied up in Chicago. Done. He would say, "Okay, thank you." I go back to the crew lounge. I go upstairs to the crew lounge. And I sit there and wait until he calls again and uh, has another train to run. And this is how the whole op session works. This is, and uh, there are guys that are down on the layout that are working yards. He's got four yards on the layout, one huge yard and then three that are fairly smaller yards. Well, there's, there's four guys down there that are, work, that are yard masters working those particular yards. And as you, I, 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 I haven't done that on the layout there. I, I tend to like to run trains, so I run trains, but I have to check as I go through each one of these yards to see if there's things I need to do, exactly what is this train doing that I'm running, and that. And uh, we, ran, we ran almost five hours a couple, couple weeks ago, and I think we ran almost 20 trains, and we moved almost 400 cars on this layout. Yeah. All prototypically. Yeah, you don't run it. You can only run at scale speeds. You can't run over over scale speeds. You, it's all signals. You can't. You've got to watch your signals. You can't move. You know, you can't be running red signals and things like that. So, very, very, very prototypical. Sounds like Hello, one heck of operations. Hi, Bill. I I just think, guys, it's it's a part of this hobby. That a lot of people miss out on. It, it's uh, it, again, it's the reason I do I do what I do. It's, it's the reason I designed the track plans like I did. If nobody else wants to see any more of these of this here, I'm going to go ahead and kick off and I'll just put myself back on. If that's all right. Um, and if, if you want to see something, I'll just leave it up. There's another question here from Muskoka Steve. Uh, do you use a local switcher in any towns to do to do the work, and then have a through freight drop off cars on the way through? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't on my layout, but again, the one I just talked about, uh, there was a gentleman who, uh, for the whole five hours, he was simply the uh, the yard master for that uh, town. And it, when you came through that town, you looked at your your car your packet of car cards and waybills. And you've seen what cars you needed to drop off at that town. And actually, what would happen in that town is you wouldn't drop them off. You would pull into that town, and you would you would stop at where he told you to stop. He would go out and pull the cars out of the consist. You didn't do anything but sit there and wait until he got those cars pulled out of there. And then maybe he would put some cars back into your train. Then you would check with the dispatcher before you left the town, and when you got the okay to leave town then you would leave town and that yard master was using a, a, a yard switcher. The cars that he, he that he pulled out of my particular train, then those cars were going to industries that either were in his area or they were going on another train that was coming through his his town there. Pretty sophisticated operation, but that's that's how these guys think through this stuff. And that's 
that's how I learn about all this stuff. And what you have to understand too is this: I have to know this stuff if I'm going to design track plans for people that operate prototypically. There. You know, it, it isn't. It isn't just that I'm pretty good at designing. It's how you design it. Will it work prototypically when when it when it's finished being designed? I have to know this stuff. There's another question here. Uh, how many operators on your layout, and how many cars do you move in about four hours? Okay, the the one we talked about here tonight, uh, when we where I showed you we ran those 16 uh, trains on the layout there. Um, I'll go back to that sequential system that I had here. Oops. Okay. There, there were 16 trains we ran. That, that was that. Depending on the uh, on the operators that I had there that night, that was four to four and a half hour session there. Uh, and usually my layout, the layout I had for this particular uh, train order sheet, the layout measured uh, 19 feet by 24 foot. In a, it was in a two and a half car garage that I had. And uh, the thing you have to realize with your operators is, I, I, I find this, I don't know, interesting to me for some reason. All of us have internal clocks, and all of our internal clocks run at different speeds. And the best example I can give you is I had a gentleman that came to operate on my layout. This goes back a number of years ago. He drove 100 miles one way to do an op session on my layout. Oh. When you live out west here, that's not <clears throat> necessarily that unusual. I, I drive 50, 55, 60 miles to operate uh, out here, so uh, you can go an extra 40 miles is no big deal. But he came he came from Nebraska to operate on my layout, and it was a 100-mile trip one direction there. His internal clock was so slow there that I gave him a train to one of the locals to run where he had to do some switching in that. A normal, very experienced operator could run that particular local. Uh, it would take him 20 minutes, 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes if we had a lot of traffic and he had to make some stops and get out of the way of traffic. But usually a 20 to 30 minute job is what it was. In, in real time, I'm talking real, real time. I gave that, I gave that gentleman that job it took him over one hour to do exactly the same job. Why? Instead of running 25, 25 scale miles an hour when he was running the train, he ran the train at about 15 scale miles per hour than that. So it took him almost twice as long to do what he needed to do. That's okay. I don't have any problem with that because I, he ran, until he was done with that train, I wasn't going to give him another train. He had to get done with that one, then he'd come back and I'll give him another train. You know, I had this. I had uh, another operator operate the same train a few months later. He did the whole thing in about 13 minutes, but he ran around the layout like it was a racetrack there. And that's just the. In and he didn't think he was going fast, like the other guy didn't think he was going that slow. It's just your, your what your internal clock uh, does for different people. So. Uh, you know, you get if you know your operators, you know there's some trains, there's some uh, uh, trains you don't give them. The, the the number one up there on the top of the list of there you're looking at here, this one that says PT turn, okay, that simply ran over to Lewiston, over to the potlash paper mill, switched out 12 cars and came back to Lewiston Yard. A very experienced operator could do that in about about 35 to 40 minutes because it was fair, it was fairly complicated it, it, you had to you had to know which cars to do in which order there were no tricks to it it was just you had to think your way through uh, pulling cars and and, and respotting other cars uh, I had a person come to the uh, off session who had this was his first option off session he'd ever been to and usually I would give those people through freights the ones that ran from staging to staging stopped in Lewiston pulled out some cars, the yard master put some cars in, and the guy went ahead and ran on to end of staging. Uh, pretty simple, pretty easy to do. Well, this particular individual says, oh, no, no, I want to do the toughest job you've got. So I said, okay, toughest job is number one up there, the uh, potlash turn. So I gave him the job to do there. We, we had a four-and-a-half-hour off session, 
he, we were two hours and 45 minutes into the op session and he still hadn't got the 12 cars spotted there. And he never did get it completed there because he, he just couldn't figure out because you have to move some cars and then you have to do a couple things and you got to move some cars you moved and there's a lot of shifting around and stuff. It, again, no tricks. It could all be done. There was You couldn't get trapped doing it. But he, he spent over two and a half hours and didn't complete the job, which a good experienced operator could do in about 35 or 40 minutes. There. So you've got to be careful what you give your operator. You've got to know your people. And, uh, Wow. That is quite the deal. <clears throat> well, I, I just hope, I'm just, I'm, all I'm trying to do here, you guys, is kind of, you know, show you another side of this hobby besides just building and running trains. There's, there's another, another part that can be done. I'm going to go ahead and kick out and come back. You'll have to look at my ugly face for the rest of the time. You've given us so many different aspects. My head's starting to spin. Well, which way should I go ahead and run certain things? And I'm sure a lot of people are thinking the same thing, too. Yeah. I do have a question as far as since you are a track planner, uh, and not everybody can have that done. However, I guess one of my big questions, I've been watching a lot of our brothers here make layouts, putting in yards. And as I know, I, I know I've done my yard wrong. I just wonder, what do you think the biggest mistake when a person plans a yard? What their biggest mistake might be? Well, they the first thing they do is they think they can put more yard in than they've got room for. Right. That's that's probably number one. They overestimate, and and that's that's really true of the the whole the whole hobby in general. People overestimate what they can put in a given space there. This is why I, I, I really emphasize whether I do it or you do it yourself, if you use a computer, a CAD system, some kind of CAD system, the program won't let you cheat. You cannot cheat with the program. If you want to draw it out by hand, you can cheat. I, I had a gentleman send me a, a, a track plan that he drew out by hand that he says, this is what I want you to design for me in the CAD system. There, he had 11 yard tracks drawn on it. He had room for five, mm. but he drew 11 on by drawing it out of with a pencil. And I, you know, I obviously had to explain to him that I can certainly put a yard in where you want to put that yard in, but you ain't going to get 11 tracks. You're going to get about five. That's 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 one mistake. The next mistake I see I see people make in yards is they don't build long enough yard lanes so that they can switch the yard without fouling the main line. And the rule of thumb I try to use, and it doesn't always work, but if I've got a yard, let's say that is in, re in real life, it's uh, four foot long. The yard, the yard would, is four foot long where you can put cars on it. I try to build a yard lead at, at least five foot long, maybe six foot long there so that I know that the yard lead is big enough you could actually pull a whole train into it and then you could sort and switch the cars into the tracks. If your yard lead isn't long enough you're constantly jockeying cars around all the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I see that mistake made a lot there and uh, the probably third or fourth on the list is they don't allow for arrival and departure tracks there. They don't. They don't think about those. Are those are two pretty important tracks to have when you're uh, when you've got a yard. But overestimating how big a yard you can have. That's the that's the big one. Yeah, I think for me personally, it was the arrival departure track. I didn't plan for that. Right. Um, yeah, it's only yeah. one. It's a long lead. It's longer than the yard, but we, that's the only way to get in and out. <laughs> there's no. There's no runaround. Yeah. Well, you'll see, you would see on a lot of my designs, and I and actually I I didn't I learned this from one of my one of my one of my buddies out here. Uh, I was designing a yard, and I happened to show it to him, and he says, uh, "Why don't you drop in double slip switch right here on this end and on that end of the yard?" He says, "It'll sure work a lot better, and you save yourself about almost ten inches of space." 
Mm -hmm. So I, I dropped in a, a double slip turnout in this one area, but he was exactly right. I, and I use double slip turnouts almost in all of my track plans now. My clients don't like it because if you go by uh, Walther's uh, Code 83 double slip turnout, it's about 80 bucks for them. Yeah. Yeah. But it saves you a whole bunch of space and it makes operations so much easier in a yard area, and that and I'm I'm just a huge fan of those now because otherwise you got to start building yard dust. Well, and that's probably the other one I should why I didn't think of this before and tell you the biggest thing that people underestimate is the length of the ladder, the yard ladder. Mm -hmm. They they don't understand. I I don't care whether you're using number fours, number fives, or number sixes. People always underestimate how much length a yard ladder takes up. It, it takes up a lot. Yeah, I got to agree with you on that because I know that when my dad designed my last one, uh, it was phenomenal because it, it, it was the same thing. He had designed like 10 or, t 10 or 12 tracks up there inside the yard and technically I was only able to go and get in about six, seven tracks, I think. Uh, I was, as I was telling you earlier this afternoon, Troy, it's, just, it's kind of interesting. I had a, a client get a hold of me, and he has a space that measures 17 wide by 27 long. And he wanted to design a layout that ran from Cumberland, Maryland to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on the old B&O system. The tracks are double, double main line and everything. And uh, so I, with the space he had, the way it was designed, I, I knew it was going to be fairly simple to design a track plan. So I suggested that we take Cumberland, Maryland, and Pittsburgh be the two staging yards at either end of the layout there. So the trains would run either from Pittsburgh to Cumberland or from Cumberland to Pittsburgh. And there was, we had a branch line coming off and some things like that. So I said to him, I says, I, I says you're, you, you're going to need to have a – for a classification freight yard somewhere between those two towns. And he, he stated to me in an email, oh, there's, yeah, there's one in it. I think the town was, I can't pronounce the town there. Well, Col it was uh, Connellville or something like that, Pennsylvania. So I said to him, I said, okay, and, and it happened to be, if you look on a Google map, Google Earth map, it, it happened to be just about halfway between uh, Cumberland, Maryland, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I told him, I said, this will work out great. I said, we'll put this yard in right about halfway through this uh, track plan, and trains can come from both directions. The, it can be the classification yard. A lot of switching can go on. <laughs> so he says to me, he says, I want it to look as much like the real yard as, I, as you can. And so I said, okay, can, you want to send me some pictures? He said, and he did. He had a bunch of real good pictures of it, uh, uh, drawings and that that he had picked up somewhere. Well, here's the problem. This is sitting in this town out in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. It had eastbound and westbound yards. It had four yards in it, and each, each section had 12 tracks in it. And, and then on top of that, between the eastbound and westbound yards, they had a roundhouse with a turntable that was sitting right in the middle between these two and he says, he says I, want you to, I want to design it like that. And, of course, what does he have? He's got a 130-foot Walther's turntable, which mm -hmm. takes up a ton of space. And so I told him, I says, we can't do it. It's, it's impossible to do it. I says, because I says, first, we can't do 12 tracks on each side. That, that's, you, just, you, you may have a pretty big space, but you don't have that kind of space. And, that. and I says, as soon as you put that Walther's turntable and roundhouse in the middle, you aren't going to be able to reach the other side of this because this was done on one side of a peninsula. So I told him, I says, we're going to, we're going to have to put the roundhouse and turntable off to one side and then we can do an eastbound, westbound uh, classification yards. Well, I, I designed it so there's five tracks on each side instead of 12. And this, this layout is going to need two, two yard masters. You're going to need a yard master to run the, westbound side of it, and there'll be a yard master to run the eastbound side of it. And the whole layout is a double main line that runs through this town. But we got it designed so that it, 
it's called selective compression. Well, this was really selective compression, and that, but we got a design so it was a replica of that the, the yards in that town. So the wow. yard ladders, I, I, I I'm surprised I forgot about that because that's a that's a big big thing when you're designing a yard. Yeah, yeah. don't you so think we all like the eye candy of lots of cars in the yard? Oh yeah, yeah. Looks, looks so cool, you know. <laughs> it looks cool. Well, and see, and I, again, when I, when I I always go back to this operation side of the hobby. The the thing about a yard is is all the yard is for is temporary storage. And when when I say temporary, I mean temporary. That that car goes in the yard because it's there either to get and it needs to go someplace. So it was brought in by something. It needs to go back out. And it's it's all temporary. And I, and I when I did the demonstration here, and I said, uh, if if your yard has got more than fifty percent full, it is full. That that's absolutely true. There, if you if you start loading the yard up with sixty five, seventy five, eighty percent of its capacity is cars in the yard, you can't switch it. You you're you're totally blocked up on trying to make up trains on that. So we consider fifty percent full to be full. Well, I'd like to thank you, Bill. This has been a great presentation. I've learned a, a whole bunch on car cars and way bills. I don't know about anybody else. I'd like to go ahead and thank all of our viewers and, and all the guests here on the panel. And uh, to remind everybody to go ahead and keep checking out YouTubemodelbuilders.com for all the latest news and schedules for the live show hosted by Big Bill Graham, and uh, which is a which is once a month, and then the eMag, which is bi-monthly. Um, once again, we're always looking for people to go ahead and and uh, write an article. You guys don't need to learn how to write or do anything specific. I mean, it could be something that's already been done. Uh, just go ahead and submit it off to JD. JD does a wonderful job on the eMag. Uh, just beautiful work. And um, go ahead and get yourself an article up in there. And I'm sure you know, even if it's a technique that's already been used, uh, there's always a different way to go ahead and do it, which might be easier for somebody else. Um, can, I do a, can I do a shameless promotion for the magazine, Troy? Sure, why not? I don't know. You'd have to talk to JD. <laughs> no, no, what it is is uh, the article that I wrote for, for this this month's issue, uh, I wrote it on something that a lot of people, I wish they would think more about, and it was choosing the era to, to uh, build your layout in. Uh, most everybody builds a layout based on a couple things. What they remember as a kid or what they like or what they are and what again what they grew up with as a kid or what they liked and that. I wish people would think more in terms of the what kind of space do I have and what's the best way to utilize that space. And but again this one we talked about here tonight in this program that was in again that was a layout that was 19 by almost 25 foot. And it was based on 1979, so it had a lot of SDs, six axle locomotives, and that. When I moved into this new house here in town, I went to a 16 by 13 room. What did I do? I sold off everything that I had there, and I went. I backdated to 1955, and everything on that on my new layout is four axle with 40 foot cars. And I did that because I knew I couldn't design a layout for the room I had and, and, and run 1979 equipment that would be believable. And that's what I wrote the article about was thinking about what's the best what's the best era to use for the space you've got to work with. And uh, I just think it's something a lot of people don't think about. Thank you, Troy. Yeah, you're absolutely right. <clears throat> a lot of people don't think about it. Yeah. Well, thank um, you. I thought this was a very good education. Uh, I, you, I learned some things. Well, the good thing about hopefully the good thing about it is we get we get these recorded, and I, I really do them for the recording because then people can go back and look at it. They don't mm -hmm. have to. You didn't have to remember everything I said here. You know, you you can go back and review it at any time you want. That's the that's the neat thing about doing kind of a PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, guys, don't forget about the Thursday night general hangouts of Johnny Rev of Southeast Rails. Um, Thanks again, Bill. It's been greatly appreciated. Uh, you want me to hang around a little bit? It'd be awesome. 
yeah, if you'd like to. Okay. Um, thanks again, guys, and uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed tonight's presentation.